Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. And boy, did a bunch of stuff happen in the Girardi case. Have you been watching the fallout? Not only was there a scathing order from the court in Illinois about two of the Girardi case attorneys, including his son-in-law, sca- scathing. And that's what we we're going to talk about today. And then the State Bar of California released an open letter disclosing exactly how many investigations there were into Tom Girardi. By the way, when you're in law school, they kind of tell you one investigation and your career's done. Girardi, though, had over 200. We're going to talk about that. So then I was like, okay, we're going to talk about these two things. Great. Can't wait to record. Going to be epic. Then, then the former CFO gets arrested for $10 million in alleged wire fraud from the law firm. And I'm like, oh, okay, buckle up. We have a lot to talk about in this podcast. And we are going to have a part two of this podcast next week. But today we are talking about the CFO arrest. We are talking about the state bar. And again, we are talking about that scathing order from the court in Illinois. It really was the Illinois court that taught, like tipped this all off. That was the tip of the iceberg, when those assets got frozen, that was the last, well, is it the first domino to fall? Yes, because that's the one that really started all of this fallout. And that's the one that I think led directly to the bankruptcy. I can't believe we are now two years into covering this case and there's been a criminal arrest. Buckle, buckle, buckle up. Oh, oh yeah. And the IRS entered the chat. That's a party for everyone that's been involved in this law firm because they've got to be looking at it going, Oh shit. There, there it is. There, whoom, there it is. There's the IRS. Um, because we knew we knew the IRS was gonna get their piece eventually. So we need to get into today's episode because it's a lot of topics. Let's just let's let's just roll. Hey there, welcome to the Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. It's really starting to feel like cozy season around Middle Tennessee. And one of the things that makes it really nice is having a delicious, easy, hot dinner every night. Because when left to my own devices, sometimes I'm just eating cheese and crackers for dinner. I know it's embarrassing, but it's just facts. Green Chef has changed that. Tonight we had the most incredible shrimp tacos. They had a great pineapple salsa. Oh, loved it, loved it, loved it. And my whole family loved it. Green Chef ships directly to your door with everything that you need for easy, balanced meals that can fit any dietary lifestyle with over 30 recipes to choose from. And they cater to things like paleo or keto or vegetarian or vegan or gluten-free or just balanced meals. Plus they are a CCOF certified organic meal kit. And because the law nerds have been such big fans of Green Chef, they have given us an incredible offer to make it really easy and affordable to try your first box and see if the Green Chef meals work for you. And don't worry, if you ever need to skip a week or skip a menu option, you can do that on their really easy to use app and website. Go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker599 and use code emilybaker599 to get $5.99 per meal in your first box and your first box ships free. That's right. $5.99 $5.99 per meal and free shipping on your first box at greenchef.com slash Emily Baker 599 using code Emily Baker 599. This offer makes it really easy for you to find out for yourself why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Thank you for being such a supportive sponsor, Green Chef. Let's get back to today's episode. So let's take a look at this arrest first. We're going to just work from the most recent thing that happened to backwards in time. We're just, we're going back. Oh my goodness. Yes, I was going to sing, we're going back in time. Yep, yep, that's what was going to happen. 
it, it will probably happen later in the episode. We've we've reined it in because I'm just still blown away. As this news was breaking last week of this arrest, I had so many questions. I still have so many questions. I'm just going to share those questions with you as we go through what happened in this arrest. So as a brief road so far, the former CFO of Girardi Keys was arrested in Maryland. He is remaining in custody, being transported to California, which is where the charges are from. These are charges. These are allegations against them. Innocent until proven guilty. But we learned a lot from the detention hearing, as we always do. Why? Because the AUSAs just tell the judge all the things that they're thinking and all the evidence that they think they're going to prove to try to ask the judge to keep the person in custody. And this former CFO was coming from the Bahamas, and it looks like they've moved quite a lot of property to the Bahamas. So this story has been covered thoroughly by the folks over at Law 360 and the LA Times. There are a number of reporters that have been on this story since the beginning and continue to do the reporting on it um, at every single turn. So the first place we are going to is Law 360 for a breakdown on what happened at that detention hearing. And then we're going to take a look at the complaint and you'll see that there's not a lot there. So for those of you that listen in the audio and you're like, I want to see the complaint, you're not missing much, but I <laughs> I will I will describe to the best of my ability, do not fear. This starts with ex Girardi Key CFO to stay in jail in $10 million theft case. Well, fraud case, but that's me being picky because wire fraud. This is coming out of Baltimore, Maryland, November 10th, 2022. A federal magistrate judge in Baltimore ordered former Girardi Key CFO Christopher Kamen to remain jailed as a flight risk on Thursday afternoon after prosecutors told the court during a hearing that he ran a $10 million side fraud scheme at the scandal-plagued law firm and recently fled to the Bahamas where he owns a $2 million home. Side fraud. He has a side piece of fraud happening while the Girardi fraud is going on. And here's my thoughts before we get any deeper into this. When I just get to wire fraud, side fraud, and we'll get into the dates that this is alleged um, in the complaint. This is alleged to have taken place right before the downfall of Girardi Keys, and we will talk about that. But here's what I'm thinking about the side fraud. We know from the contempt hearing, we know from other court filings that Tom Girardi did not allow people really to have access to the books. And for everyone that wants to say, Erica must have known, look, Erica benefited, I still don't know what she knew, but Tom Girardi was keeping other attorneys at the firm in the dark. It's not unreasonable for me to believe that Erica also didn't know what the fuck was happening in this law firm. So Tom Girardi's keeping most people out of the books, except obviously the CFO. Early in the bankruptcy, the CFO pled the fifth and was not deposed. And at that point, I was saying, well, what else? Like, what else? If you're pleading the fifth, what else? Is it tax issues? What are the issues? Because you're remaining silent, which is your right, because you need that right. So I was curious then. I mean, yes, you can always, you can always plead the fifth, even if you have nothing to hide when the cops come to talk to you. It's interesting in a bankruptcy of a law firm, because if you just have the books, just give them the books. So if Tom Girardi doesn't know what's going on with this side fraud, is it because he is stealing from clients and not looking at the books very carefully? Or is he not looking at the books very carefully because they are moving things around in a way that is perhaps not strictly legal? And so who who is he going to tell if the CFO is stealing from Tom Girardi to the tune of their alleging $10 million, who's Tom Girardi going to tell? Excuse me, officers, my CFO embezzled from me while I was embezzling from clients. So for a CFO that might be minded towards taking some cash, who's going to tell on you? Like, you're going to get caught when the entire ship goes under. And maybe the thought is the entire ship will never go under because it's so much money and Tom Girardi is so powerful and they haven't caught him yet. So maybe they never will. Or did the CFO see this ship sinking in September 2020 and say, oh shit, it's, go it's going down. 
I'm yelling timber. And at that point, he took out $10 million and was planning to run. The urge to sing Take the Money and Run on the tales of making a Kesha reference is really high right now. And I am trying to not downplay how fucked and how serious this is by singing the Eagles. However, is that the thought here? I see that it's going down. What's another 10 mil? What's another 10 mil? What's another 10 mil that could go to the clients? What's another 10 mil that could go to the Rigomez family who's owed over $11 million? What's, an, what's, what's another 10 mil for the CFO to go and do what? And where is it? There's a $2 million house in the Bahamas. Where's the rest of the money? Where'd it go? The rage I feel is palpable um, and it almost makes me laugh because I'm so mad and that's my inappropriate response to strong emotion. Either sadness and anger both tend to result in me laughing about things. So I'm just, I'm blown away. But also, if this wasn't directly coming from the clients who were stolen from, if he's just defrauding Tom Girardi and this is just within the law firm, you you recover differently. But now we know Girardi's stealing from the clients and his CFO is stealing from him. It doesn't absolve him of the stealing from clients because you bet, bet we are getting into that when we talk about the state bar and when we talk about the scathing order from the judge in Illinois. This is not, I do not have any empathy for Tom Girardi that his CFO stole $10 million. None is alleged to have stolen $10 million. None. Because that's still client money. Because that's not profit. Because when the judge in Illinois said, where's the $2 million for the Lion Air victims, clients? Where's the money? Tom Girardi's lawyer said he doesn't have any money and the judge froze his assets. And there was no money there. And Tom Girardi said, I had money and it's all just gone. Which also might be the truth. He might have had money that he did not procure legally that's also just gone because, well, the feds are alleging that the CFO took 10 fucking million dollars. We're only a paragraph in. We're only a paragraph in. We're only a paragraph in. The chat is reminding me to take the money and run as Steve Miller band. <laughs> I got I got it wrong. You're right, chat. You're right. <laughs> and if you're wondering, Emily, how is there a chat? It's a podcast. The the members get to do the behind the scenes podcast recordings with me. And it's so much fun because the chat is always so wise. And instead of just me, it's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of us that all have the same nerdy brains that get to talk about the thing. So thank you very much, chat. Getting back to this article, they break down the detention hearing saying, during a detention hearing, AUSA Colleen McQuinn, McGinn, G-U-I-N-N, said the firm is the subject of a larger investigation. Let me roll that back for you. The AUSA said the firm is subject of a larger investigation involving a $100 million theft scheme. Let me say it again. The feds are officially and have officially said that the law firm is subject to a larger investigation for a hundred million dollar theft scheme. Look, when I said this law firm was running like a Ponzi scheme in 2020, there were other legal commentators up on Twitter making comments about the words that I used. I still stand by it. They were running the law firm like a fucking Ponzi scheme. And the feds have been investigating probably since 2020. Now the feds like to take their time and there's a ton of paperwork that's a giant shit show in this case. But having the CFO in custody, what are you going to do if you're the CFO? $100 million theft scheme? $10 million theft scheme? Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Let me cooperate with you and tell you everything I know and we will go up the chain. How did they break the college admission scandal? They found the guy that was the head of it. And he's like, let me tell you what everybody else is up to. And they gave him a deal and prosecuted everyone else. He still was prosecuted, but he took a deal first. And part of that deal was laying out everything he knew. Do I think that this CFO was immediately going to do that? Yes. Yes, I do. 
That is my strongest gut suspicion and probably why the feds targeted him first and made the arrest of him first. Because what solidifies your case when you're looking at a $100 million theft scheme than having the CFO? Nothing. There's nothing stronger than that. Woo! So the feds have entered the chat. The firm is subject of a larger investigation involving a $100 million theft scheme. You better believe they are. The AUSA urged the magistrate judge, Matthew Maddox, yes, yes, it sounds like something from, I don't know, a, a Marvel movie, Matthew Maddox. Wait, I now need, <laughs> I now need to know. I now need to know. I have to look something up. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna sidetrack for a second. I, for a moment, couldn't remember Daredevil's last name because it's Matt, and Matt could be Matthew, but I think Matt Murdock is, um, I think it's Matthew, I think it's Matthew Murdock. So Matt Murdock, and between the Murdock and the Maddox, I was like, wait a second, is the judge Daredevil? That's where, that's where my brain went. My brain went immediately, wait, Judge Judge Maddox. Isn't that some like Marvel stuff? Yes, it sounds like some Marvel stuff. Why? Because it sounds like Daredevil. Moving on. The AUSA urged Judge Matthew Maddox, Judge Maddox, to forbid Cayman from posting bond, saying there would be no way of knowing whether the money or property used to secure his release would be quote unquote dirty. What they mean by that is stolen funds or funds from the scheme. There's no way to know that that money is not money that is eventually going to try to be uh, dis disengorged and given back to the victims. He is responsible for cooking. Wait, th no, this is a direct quote. My brain is trying to make this quote not what it is. This is the direct quote from the AUSA. He is responsible for the cooking of the books. At the Los Angeles plaintiff's firm, said the AUSA, who appeared in court alongside a special special agent for the IRS. So we know that the IRS has also entered the chat. The IRS was there in court. The IRS is going to be the undoing of everyone who they don't get. Everyone who they don't get directly is going to be got by the IRS. And when people have asked, what do you think the chances are that Erica Girardi gets in some trouble? I think the IRS is the biggest concern. If you're Erica Girardi, your biggest concern is what the fuck was on your taxes for your business, for the law firm, because the law firm was not being run as an official business entity. It was being run through Girardi. And on all of those, all of those tax returns that you're signing your name to, there has got to be massive amounts of concern. Or you hire your own investigator to start looking into it and you go to the feds yourself and say, look, this is what we've found. I'm happy to work with you in whatever way I can. Because the IRS is, is going to be all up in this biz. The AUSA then said that Cayman, the CFO, fled to the Bahamas on September 21st. Federal agents arrested Cayman on Saturday at Baltimore's International Airport after he stepped off of a plane from the island nation. Federal prosecutors in Los Angeles have charged Cayman with wire fraud. Why were you coming back, though? Like, what, what did you need so badly in Baltimore? Do you think the feds aren't everywhere? They're the feds. They're the federal agents. And you know what they like to prosecute? Money shit. And you know what this case is? Real high profile. There's real loud people on the internet. Hi, I'm real loud people on the internet saying, why hasn't anybody been arrested yet? So this case isn't going away. In ordering Cayman to remain in custody, Judge Maddox cited Cayman's financial, financial resources and incentive to flee. The bottom line is that you are under threat of a very significant prison sentence, the judge told Cayman. Cayman wore a red jumpsuit and was handcuffed when he was brought in for Thursday's hearing at the federal courthouse and at times shook his head as the AUSA detailed the government's case against him. His attorney, Jesse Liu of Skadden Arps, argued that Cayman was not a flight risk. Already had a lawyer. Already had a lawyer saying he had flown to Maryland where his sister lives to handle a family matter. She said he had previously traveled back and forth between the U.S. and the Bahamas and came back of his own accord. Did he know there was an arrest warrant? The detention hearing offered the first details about Cayman's alleged role in what happened at Girardi Keys. 
through an affidavit supporting the wire fraud complaint against him, did remain under seal. Cayman, who had a $350,000 salary, was responsible for cutting checks for the firm and had detailed knowledge of its finances, clients, and attorneys. Yet they're going to want to chat with him immediately. The AUSA said that Cayman funded a luxurious lifestyle through his scheme, including multiple properties and expensive trips, such as an African safari. She said he paid $20,000 a month to a woman he met on an escort service website. Okay. Cayman recently wired more than $2 million to a law firm in the Bahamas to purchase a house there. The home sale was finalized in October. Quote, this is not a Robin Hood type of theft, she said. This is purely greed and a lavish lifestyle. I, it, it feels like it's like, who's going to know? Who's going to know? They're never going to know. They're going to know. They're never going to know. They're going to know. Eventually, they're going to know. Do you think the justification was, well, I'm stealing less than Girardi is, so it's fine? Like, they'll catch him and not me? I, what was the plan here? It goes on to say that a Chicago federal judge overseeing litigation stemming from the 2018 crash of Lion Air Flight 610 found Girardi Keys had stolen millions of dollars from its clients, the families of those who died. Since then, many more clients in unrelated cases have come forward with similar allegations against Girardi Keys. The firm is in bankruptcy, owing an estimated $100 million to former clients, co-counsels, lenders, and vendors. The firm's founder, famed trial lawyer, now infamous, Tom Girardi, has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, say court documents, um, and placed into a conservatorship. He was disbarred in June. We're going to talk about the state bar in a minute. Prosecutors filed a one-page criminal complaint against uh, came in on Monday saying the wire fraud took place sometime around September 16th, 2020. At the time, Jordy Keese was under pressure to pay settlement funds it owed to several clients, including the widows and orphans of the Lion Air plane crash the firm was representing in litigation against Boeing. Until Thursday's hearing, few details were available of the alleged crimes. An affidavit filed was um, filed under seal or restricted from public view. Cayman is a defendant in the civil racketeering case filed in July by Girardi Keese's former co-counsel Edelson PC, which alleges he was, quote, responsible for disappearing client money out of the firm's trust account and then would siphon it off into other accounts. He was among the few people at Girardi Keese with authority to sign checks and wire funds from the firm's bank accounts, former attorneys at the firm have said in court documents. Cayman started as a bookkeeper at Girardi Keese in 2000, five years after he graduated from UC Santa Barbara with a bachelor's degree in math. He rose to the role of CFO in 2012. Public records show that during his time at Girardi Keys, Cayman amassed millions of dollars worth of real estate in California and Nevada. And Cayman recently sold those properties and transferred ownership of others to newly created to a newly created company that he controls, according to property records. In 2013, he bought a million-dollar house overlooking the ocean in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. Hey, so Cal. Good to see ya. Four years later, he bought a luxury house in Encino, California for $2.7 million. When did Encino become bougie? All the Beverly Hills housewives moved to Encino, too. It's not the real housewives of Encino, but that's where they all live. Encino got bougie. You got bougie, Encino. It's because there's actual space out there. <laughs> there's actual land. Cayman sold the Encino house for $3.3 million last year, according to property records. He sold his RPV home for $1.95 million in September. He created Mellow Pearl LLC in Nevada in October 2021 after this went down and granted ownership of a Las Vegas home to the company in February, according to state and county records. On Thursday, real estate sites show the house was listed for $699,000 and under contract. Oh, shit. You, what you don't want to do is get arrested by the feds for wire fraud when you're in the middle of selling a property. It's going to fuck, it's going to fuck things up. Came in and a business partner sold another Las Vegas property they co-owned for $300,000 in December. Mellow Pearl still co-owns one property in Nevada. On Thursday, the AUSA noted that Cayman had been liquidating his assets, saying it was further evidence he was a flight risk. I don't disagree. 
The funny thing about the Bahamas is when you spend that kind of money on a house, you can gain residency immediately. So I wonder if that's why he was going through that process in uh, in the Bahamas to purchase such an expensive property. Let's take a look at the criminal complaint real quick be because, well, it's the only official document with regard to the charges that we have so far. This was from 2.10 p.m. November 7th, 2022. It is docket number one, United States District Court, Central District of California, criminal complaint by telephone or other reliable electronic means. They must have known when he was flying in to try to get him. It looks like this case has not been prelim. It hasn't gone to a preliminary hearing and didn't go to the indictment stage. This is a complaint, not an indictment. Um, I, the complainant in this case, state the following is true to the best of my knowledge and belief on or about the date of September 16th, 2020, County of Los Angeles, Central District of California. The defendant violated 18 USC section 1343 wire fraud. This criminal complaint is based on these facts. See attached affidavit. Guess what? We can't. And then it's continued on the attached sheet and then signed by uh, a special agent in Los Angeles. And that is what document they used to effectuate the arrest when Cayman landed in Maryland. The details that continue to come out about this are absolutely wild. Before we get to the LA Times reporting on this, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor. I know for some people it might be no shave November, but that's not what's happening over at my house. Why? Because as the temperature drops, all of the moisture is just yeeted from the air and I need to moisturize my entire body, which just feels better when you're all silky smooth. And today's sponsor, Manscaped, is going to get you all the way there. It's okay to make sure that your package is ready to be unwrapped, even in November. And if for some reason your person wants to get into a no-shave November, Manscaped has got incredible body wash and a hydrating body spray that will also take care of the fact that it is so dry outside that all you want to do is moisturize all the time. The body wash is infused with aloe vera and sea salt, and it smells delicious. And now's the season to plan to make everyone's jingle bells smooth? <laughs> Too much? Not enough? Maybe just right. Go to manscaped.com with code LAWNERD and get 20% off and free shipping. That's right, 20% off and free shipping and use code LAWNERD at manscaped.com. Look, the Performance Package 4.0 has everything that you need. It is one of my favorite things. So go check it out at Manscaped. Thank you for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to today's show. And going to reporting from the Los Angeles Times, the headline is Tom Girardi firm's CFO embezzled 10 million, spent thousands on escort and real estate, prosecutors say. This is coming from Matt Hamilton and Harriet Ryan. In a Maryland courtroom, the man who once held the purse strings at the famous lawyer's corruption-plagued law firm stands accused of a federal crime. The CFO of Tom Girardi's law firm embezzled at least $10 million from firm bank accounts and used stolen funds to renovate his Los Angeles home, purchase a Caribbean mansion, and shower an escort with a monthly stipend and gifts, including a $120,000 purse, a federal prosecutor said in court on Thursday. Look, you know I love the details in Law 360. Law 360 doesn't always include the T. Great reporting, very fast. Brandon Lowry does an incredible job, but I need to know exactly what purse. What purse? Does the reporting ever tell us what purse? Was it a Birkin? What is it? Is it a Himalayan Birkin? What purse cost $120,000? I mean, and I'm a bougie bitch. I have some purses. I love purses, but what? Just... It's got to be a rare Birkin. It has to be. What else costs that much other than a fucking Tesla? I mean, I realize there's lots of other cars that cost like $120,000, but the poor S, look, if you're the escort, I, I have no judgment, get your bag. But call a lawyer because um, the IRS is going to be looking at every single cent that was given from this individual to anyone. Lawyer, lawyer, lawyer immediately. 
Lawyer immediately. Lawyer immediately. $120,000 purse. I need more details on the purse. Do you think if I emailed the AUSA, they would tell me? (laughs) I mean, maybe. But also get a lawyer. Also get a lawyer. Also get a lawyer. Because the feds are going to want to talk to you too. Lawyer. Immediately. And, um, And don't go down for this dude. Dudes aren't, this dude's not worth it. This dude's not worth it. Don't go, don't go down. Don't go down for this dude. Lawyer. Lawyer. Government lawyers disclosed allegations against former Girardi Key CFO Christopher Kamen at a detention hearing in U.S. District Court in Maryland. The 49-year-old was arrested on wire, on a wire fraud charge filed by LA prosec, well, LA AUSAs. So f- by the feds in the Western District, which is covers Los Angeles. So when I hear LA prosecutors, I always think, you know, my former employer at the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, it's the feds. So the AUSAs. Um, f- that's just me being picky again. Uh, on a wire fraud charge filed by LA prosecutors last week as he arrived at Baltimore Washington International Airport on a flight from the Bahamas. How came in figured into the corruption at the Girardi Keys firm has been a persistent mystery because he pled the fifth and we've heard nothing about it. Came and worked at Girardi Keys for 20 years and although he was not an attorney, his role gave him intimate knowledge of the vast sums of money flowing through the accounts from multi-million dollar legal settlements and some upwards of a billion dollars. This is why the feds want to talk to you, boo-boo. Since the downfall of the firm, he has repeatedly invoked his right against self-incrimination when pressed to provide information in court proceedings. The allegations laid out in court Thursday make clear what the government believes Cayman's place was and only heighten questions and intrigue over the sweeping corruption in the firm run by Girardi. Once one of California's preeminent trial lawyers, a Times investigation found that the legal legend cultivated cozy ties with those in a position to stop unethical conduct. <clears throat> yup, that's an understatement including regulators at the state bar. Oh, and federal judges. And and state judges. And the police chief. And the sheriff. And literally everyone fucking else. Except for, you know who? Judge Durkin in Illinois, who was like, I'm sick of your California bullshit and I'm freezing your assets. And that's what it took. The article from the LA Times goes on to say last week, in response to a lawsuit from the Times, the state bar revealed it had received more than 205 complaints against Girardi Over four decades. Don't worry, we're going to go look at that open letter where the state bar is like, uh, our bad? The agency did not take public action until his his firm was forced out of business, records show. Yeah, until all of the chips fell, they did nothing. During the hearing on Thursday, AUSA Colleen McGinn indicated that Cayman was running his own quote-unquote side fraud for years apart from the lodger thefts larger theft scheme that unfolded at Girardi Keys. That separate criminal operation remains under active investigation, she said. It involves losses of about $100 in client money and several possible, quote, co-schemers, including attorneys and Cayman, she said. Wonder what attorneys she's referring to. I wonder if it's the same attorneys that Jay Edelson is referring to when he filed a civil racketeering case against Tom Girardi's son-in-law and Griffin, the Griffin and Lyra attorneys that we're going to be talking about because they play heavily into both the um, scathing order and opinion from the judge Durkin in Illinois and into um, into the, well, not really into the state bar stuff, but into the Edelson PC lawsuit alleging civil racketeering. So possible co-schemers, including attorneys, That doesn't say exclusively, attorneys. It was unclear whether those in the government crosshairs included Girardi. It's going to be hard because of the conservatorship and his age. The 83-year-old who owned the firm and, along with Cayman, controlled its bank accounts was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease last year and is in a court-ordered conservatorship. He volunteered. He asked to be put in the conservatorship. And so did his brother, conservator. Continuing on with the article from the LA Times, with money stolen from Girardi Keys, the prosecutors said Cayman lived well beyond his $350,000 salary. Pilfered funds helped 
uh, finance a 13-month remodel on one of his five residences, five, five, res five residences, and allowed him to pay $20,000 per month to an unidentified woman who he met on an escort website, the prosecutor said. He took her on expensive vacations using stolen money and would lavish her with gifts, including the costly purse. $120,000, I have questions. This is not a Robin Hood type of theft, the prosecutor said in the downtown Baltimore uh, courtroom. This is purely greed and a lavish lifestyle. The words lavish lifestyle have come up over and over and over in connection with this case, including with the Edelson PC filing of that initial complaint in the Lion Air case saying that they believed Tom Girardi was taking money from clients to fund a lavish lifestyle with Erica Girardi. After hearing a lengthy description of the evidence against Cayman, U.S. Magistrate Judge Matthew Maddox ordered him to remain in federal custody and be transferred to California on the wire fraud charge. The judge noted that Cayman faced a very long sentence if convicted, demonstrated, quote, a lack of trustworthiness, and had taken steps to build a life in the Bahamas. I believe that if you did know about the arrest warrant, your return would have been unlikely, Judge Maddox said. The precise mechanism of Cayman's alleged embezzlement scheme and the identities of those involved were unclear. Some filings in the case remain sealed. At least some of the embezzlement involved kickbacks from lawyers, the prosecutor suggested. How much did the lawyers know? How much did the lawyers know? Can we stop asking about what Erica knew? I want to know what Erica knew too. But how much did the lawyers know? The lawyers were in a position to stop it. I don't think Erica truly was in a position to stop Tom Girardi from doing anything. But the lawyers were. The lawyers were. What did they know? And why were they giving kickbacks to the CFO? Have you ever done that? Y'all have jobs. Have you ever given kickbacks to the CEO? The CFO? What the fuck? What is happening in this case? Just when you think there can't be any more fuckery, it just, it keeps going and going and going. I said, this is the tip of the iceberg a thousand times in this case, and it just keeps going and going and going. And I guess that's the point, but at some point, the ship crashes into the iceberg and, and Rose says, I'll never let go, Jack. And then there we are. But no, two years into covering this case, and we're not, we're not even there yet. There's no there yet. <sighs> At one point, the AUSA, who was joined in court by a special agent from the IRS, said Cayman was, quote, responsible for the cooking of the books. Well, now we've seen that direct quote twice. The, cook the cooking of the books with the things. The things with the cooking of the books in the nonstick pan. Yikes. In the view of investigators, the alleged embezzlement totaled at least $10 million, and federal agents have continued to try to hunt down his assets and any secret funds. You bet they have. After Girardi Keys collapsed in 2020, Cayman sold or put up for sale properties he owned in Rancho Palos Verdes, Encino, Fresno County, and Nevada. In court, uh, AUSA McQuinn framed the un unloading of properties as part of a larger effort to liquidate assets adding that some of the proceeds, some $2.2 million, were wired this year to a law firm in the Bahamas to purchase a residence there. The woman whom came and met on an escort service was not named in court, but she has emerged as a key witness in the case. In an interview with federal agents, she said Cayman had floated the possibility of changing his name and fleeing the country. Weird that he was living in the Bahamas then. So weird. The article continues to say the prosecutor said Cayman had become increasingly quote unquote paranoid cycling through multiple phones. <laughs> the feds are still going to find you. And he had asked the woman if she would come live with him in the Caribbean. The woman who was contact, we're getting much more information from look, the LA times is like, let me bring you the tea. Here is the tea. The woman who was contacted by the FBI in August said she in turn tipped off Cayman. Oh, so he knew in August and bought the home in October. Hmm, interesting. So she was contacted by the FBI in August. She tipped off Cayman once he learned other, quote, 
unquote co-schemers had also been contacted by investigators. He booked a flight September 21st for the Bahamas. So the FBI has also talked to others. Who else has the FBI talked to? Oh gosh, wouldn't I love to know? Wouldn't I love to know who else the FBI has chatted with and what they have said? Because because you know what you know what's going to happen in a white collar crime case. Everybody is going to point the finger at everybody else, and the person with the most information is going to come out on top. So on September 21st, he booked a flight for the Bahamas, where he remained until last Friday. The article goes on to say Cayman recently closed on a Bahamas home valued at 2.4 million. The prosecutor said. The AUSA noted that foreigners in the Bahamas with property valued at more than $750,000 can secure permanent residency, which would complicate future efforts to detain him. Your Honor, he has taken efforts to stay the fuck in the Bahamas and then flew back. This is our only chance to grab him. Citing the overseas residents and the re recent liquidation of assets, McQuinn argued that Cayman was a flight risk who could not be trusted out on bond further McQuinn added that the sustained embezzlement scheme cast doubt on the origins of any money put up for bail. Any promise of monetary bond is paved with dirty money, McQuinn said. Defense attorney Jesse K. Liu rejected the idea that her client was a flight risk and said that in recent months, Cayman had made multiple back and forth trips from the U.S. to the Bahamas. She noted that her client was arrested while returning to Maryland to visit family and that regardless, the Bahamas still had an extradition treaty with the U.S. Quote, if Mr. Cayman was trying to flee, Lou said he did a very bad job of it. When your defense attorney's argument is you suck at running away, I don't know if that's the strongest argument that you want to make. Sometimes it's the only argument you have, but I don't know if that's the argument you want to make. So we now have the CFO of Girardi Keys in the hands of the feds allegedly running a $10 million side fraud from the Girardi Keys firm and I, this, again, on the criminal case, this is the tip of the Fed arrests. We now know that there is a Fed investigation. The IRS has entered the chat. There are co-schemers that are talking, have talked, or have been contacted by the FBI. The FBI! And I expect we will see much more to come of this and more arrests. And we will, in, in due time, learn who's been talking to the Feds and who is going to take deals, and who is going to turn on the others. When Jen Shaw got arrested with Stuart Smith, the day that that went down, I said, Stuart Smith's play is to immediately talk to their lawyer, call the feds, and say, I will tell you what you want to know. I imagine that that is the play that Christopher Kamen is going to take with the, I'm not going down for any of you fuckers. And I wonder how nervous the other attorneys that have worked at Girardi Keys are feeling in light of all of this, because I imagine they are not sleeping easily. Um, and if they weren't sleeping easily before, maybe now that they're the ones on the line, they actually feel some kind of way. Because when hundreds of millions of dollars were stolen from their clients, nobody seemed to give a fuck, including the state bar. Let's talk about them next. But first, we have one more sponsor today. Thank you to our sponsors. It is November. It is the month of sponsorships, and we appreciate it. I can't believe it's already that time of the year where I'm thinking about holiday gatherings, holiday parties, and for our family, a holiday vacation. And I want to make sure I look my best. That means a little new shopping for some clothes and for new underpinnings. So if you're ready to look and feel your best, check out our sponsor, Honey Love. I have worn a lot of different kinds of shapewear, and most of the time you feel like you are over-squeezed or suffocating, but not with Honey Love. Honey Love is on a mission to create the most comfortable shapewear, and it's not just shapewear. They have amazing bras so that you can wear what's comfortable, make the girls look good, and not have to worry about underwire digging in or things digging into your back. You don't have to readjust and you can get dressed with confidence. And are we going to ignore the fact that for the last few years we haven't had to go anywhere and now we actually have to, well, get back out into the world? Why not do it comfortably? You know that this is literally what I'm about. Ease and comfort. And Honey Love is making it really easy for you to try their shapewear and their bras today. Get 20% off your entire order at honeylove.com slash lawnerd. 
You can save using the link down below or just support our show by going to honeylove.com slash lawnard. You have to check out the crossover bra. It is comfortable and supportive without the underwire that's digging into the sides. It is a fantastic go-to. Thanks so much, Honey Love, for sponsoring this episode. So on November 3rd, 2022, lawyers in California got an email from the state bar that was an open letter regarding the state bar's Thomas V. Girardi disclosure. It's not what I was expecting. And my phone was also just blowing up with, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? Um, the state bar doesn't email a tremendous amount. So yes, I saw it. I was surprised. It was also covered by, you know, the LA Times Law 360 and others. It is also publicly available on the state bar website. And I will put a link if you want your own memorial copy of the state bar's YouTuber apology. If my bun wasn't so on point today, I would literally pull my hoodie up and read it in YouTuber apology voice. But that's what this is. But they did include a chart. And don't we just love a chart? Yes, I do. My little heart loves a chart. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. So let's get into this letter from the State Bar of California on November 3rd. Open letter regarding the State Bar's Thomas V. Girardi disclosure. Today, the State Bar of California is releasing information about disciplinary matters that were opened and closed over the past 40 years involving now disbarred attorney Thomas V. Girardi. 40 years. 40 years. M most of my, like the substantial majority of my life. 40 years. 40 years. The handling of the Girardi matters brought to light serious failures in the state bar's attorney discipline system. Failures that have contributed to a lack of confidence in the state bar's ability to carry out our core responsibility of protecting the public. The bankruptcies found that it's like over a hundred million dollars. Like, you know that, right? Like a hundred million dollars. So yes, I would say the public lack of confidence and the ability to protect the public is maybe an understatement. It goes on to say there is no excuse being offered here. Girardi caused irreparable harm to hundreds of his clients and the state bar could have done more to protect the public. Yup. We can never allow something like this to happen again. Agreed. I speak on behalf of the entire board of trustees when I say, Emily, introduction, what the fuck were those guys before us doing anyway? How the fuck have we gotten stuck with this mess? And why didn't anyone deal with this 40 years ago? What parties were they getting to go to that they allowed all of this to slide? And how is this now landing on our lap when everybody who is really intricately involved in this is already gone? But that's just my supposition about what they wanted to say. Let's go on to what they actually say. I speak on behalf of the entire board of trustees when I say that we want the public to know that we take our statutory mission to protect the public seriously. As articulated in our new strategic plan, our public protection mission is the guiding light for all that we do. There's a strategic plan. It's the most corporate shit I've ever heard. We have a strategic plan. Moreover, meaningful change begins with a culture that values transparency and accountability. Principles of the Board of Trustees and State Bar Leadership hold central in our decision-making. Mm -hmm. With a culture that values transparency and accountability. I will just say that the LA Times had to go to the Supreme Court of California to try to get a little transparency. I wonder how that's resolved. We're going to have to look at that next week. They had to go to court to get some transparency. So I appreciate that you say that you have a culture that values transparency, but when the LA Times asked for it, y'all were like, yeah, nah. In the spirit and pursuit to a discretionary determination made by the chief trial counsel and me, 
the State Bar is now releasing as much information about the Girardi matters as we believe is allowed under the law, which is fair. Lawyers be lawyers. What are we allowed to disclose? What are we not allowed to disclose? What are the rules that govern us? And that's part of what the Supreme Court's going to have to decide as well. What are we allowed to disclose? The Girardi disclosure, the numbers, that's the very dramatic title of the heading. Over the past 40 years, the State Bar opened 205 disciplinary matters about Girardi. Every law student everywhere's head explodes when they read this because in law school, they're like, if they open one, you're done. If if the State Bar even whiffs your name, you're probably going to get disbarred. The fear that is put into you is likened only to my Catholic upbringing. The fear, the fear. And then you sit here and be like, so what? That's just, you all were just lying? Oh, okay. You just want to terrorize law students, terrorize law students and be like, well, you know, if you make an honest mistake, you're going to probably get disbarred. So uh, go forth and practice with integrity, folks. 205 opened disciplinary matters. Notice the language here. Opened disciplinary matters. You know what happens when they get disciplinary matters that they deem aren't worth it? They don't open it. Not everything's opened. They opened 205 disciplinary matters. There could have been more that were never opened because they were deemed completely not credible. Okay. Of the 205 matters, approximately 120 matters involved allegations relating to client trust account violations. It should only take one client trust account violation. That's not your money. And that's like the sacred no-no of law. Don't fuck with client funds. Ever. And if the account like accidentally gains interest or the account gets charged a fee that you don't account for, you might also get disbarred. Even if you didn't do anything. Could happen. Explain yourselves. How were these trust accounts not being monitored? 120 related to client trust account violations. The remaining disciplinary matters involve various allegations ranging from failure to communicate with clients to failure to perform, as well as misrepresentations to courts and clients, among others. Misrepresentations to courts and clients. Courts like judges? Like judges, there's misrepresentations to judges? That doesn't get you disbarred? Because I sure thought it did. Sure thought a duty of candor was a thing. But what do I know? I'm not an expert in attorney ethics. I'm just an attorney who thought that, like, this was all shit you can't do. Silly me. Among others, misrepresentations to the courts and clients. Of these 205 disciplinary matters, the State Bar received 69 complaints on or after December 18th, 2020, when a petition was filed to force Girardi's law firm into bankruptcy. Nearly 60 of those recent complaints alleged client trust account violations. Yeah, when everyone, my speculation, when everyone who was like waiting for their funds realized that that wasn't going to happen, they were like, oh shit, this law firm is going under. They're alleging that client funds were stolen and I haven't gotten paid either. He keeps telling me it's coming. Three of the 205 disciplinary matters resulted in Girardi's disbarment earlier this year. Oh, so three was the magic number? In 40 years, you didn't have three, like, I don't know, 39 years ago? Just a question. An additional 64 matters were thereafter closed due to his disbarment. Oh, there's nothing we can do. He was disbarred. After a disbarment, there is no further disciplinary action the state bar can take. Before his disbarment, Girardi was never publicly disciplined by the state bar. I'm 
Just read that again. Before his disbarment, Girardi was never publicly disciplined by the state bar. 13 other matters were previously resolved through non-public measures at investigation pre-filing or post-filing stages. 13? 13 had action taken on them. There's a footnote. Non-public measures may include non-public private reprovals, agreements in lieu of discipline, admonitions, warning letters, or directional letters. I'm sure these clients would like to send the state bar a directional letter directing them to fuck all the way off. But, you know, that's just my speculation. The remaining 125 matters were handled as follows. 60 complaints, or 48%, were closed at intake. Another 61 complaints, or just under 49%, were closed after investigation. And four complaints, just over 3%, were closed at the pre-filing stage. A full disclosure accompanied by explanation of information is attached. The state bar's response. We recognize that the Girardi situation has undermined the public's trust in the state bar as an institution. In response, the state bar has initiated a number of efforts, highlighted below, and outlined bold goals for the attorney discipline system. We made significant progress on many fronts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Bar initiated investigation of Girardi matters. When, when did you, when, when, over 40 years, when did you decide to investigate it? The state bar began the process of righting the wrongs brought to light by the Girardi matters in 2021. When we conducted an audit of all closed disciplinary matters concerning Girardi. That was followed by the launch of a comprehensive investigation, still ongoing, into prior actions taken by any staff or other state bar affiliated persons to determine whether the state bar's handling of the matters involving Girardi was affected by his connections to or relationships or influence with these individuals. Gee, I wonder. As I have said previously about this investigation, we are pursuing the facts as vigorously as possible under the law and will go where the evidence leads us. We will share more information about both the audit and the investigation when the latter is completed. The thing that is difficult for the current members of the state bar is the people that would have been involved in most of this are long gone. This is 40 years of fuck around. <sighs> Girardi was disbarred and the state bar accelerated client security fund payments. This is the only part of the letter I find reassuring. The chief trial counsel sought disbarment of Girardi in 2021. Following a default, Girardi was disbarred by the Supreme Court. Default meaning he didn't answer at all. Also in 2021, even before Girardi was disbarred, the State Bar's Client Security Fund began making payments to his victims on an accelerated basis. Good. It is the least that can happen. It is the only thing I was happy to find out about in this letter. I was stunned and remain stunned about how many investigations, how many complaints, how many complaints involving client funds. But at least some of those clients are being made whole by the State Bar. Reforms to attorney disciplinary, uh, discipline system, including establishing the new client trust account protection program. Under the board's leadership, the state bar has developed and implemented much needed reforms to the attorney discipline system. We will continue to pursue these efforts to ensure the state bar fulfills our mission to protect the public. And then they talk about that. But these trust accounts should have been regularly audited. They're separate types of accounts. It shouldn't need new policies. It should just be enforced. But... They are using new tools and policies to identify and address patterns of complaints and restrictions on the use of non-public measures, meaning they're going to do things publicly more so that, you know, if you look at an attorney's profile, you can tell if there's been a problem. Uh, the Board of Trustees also appointed uh, George S. Cardona, a former federal prosecutor, as the State Bar's chief trial counsel, who was confirmed by the Senate earlier this year, the first such confirmation in 10 years. The new leadership team was further bolstered by the hiring of Ellen uh, Datvian as the state bar's new general counsel. So there are new people at the helm trying to look into this. I hope some of them are as outraged as the public is because it is a stain on the profession as a whole. 
Today's disclosure is another step forward in advocating our commitment to protect the in advancing our commitment to protect the public with greater impact. It it sounds like they're pledging their commitment. The state bar is committed to doing everything in our power to prevent something like this from happening again. I mean, with this, the shit's well out of the horse. I'm glad to hear that they are at least reimbursing clients um, out of the bar's funds. They then attach um, 45 pages of charts that show every single matter um, and what happened. They show the case number, the date open, the date closed, and what it was. And this starts December 5th, 1983, failure to perform duty abandonment of client, failure to account in 1985, um, on and on and on. Um, misrepresentations to client, misrepresentations to court, exorbitant unconscionable fee, commingling, conversion, misappropriation, misappropriations to client, that's in 1985, discretionary decisions, lack of failure to, uh, lack of or failure to communicate, failure to turn over file. These are all from, these are from 1980, like 1985. Multiple inside of a year and nothing. On and on and on and on. And that goes through year over year over year for, um, four pages, you know, for like 40 plus pages. And then it tells you if there was a private approval, it tells you if they took any action at all. So again, I will link this if you want to look at what the state bar said. It's also publicly available on their website. It truly is stunning to see how many people tried to raise the red flag. It was like red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. And the bar was like, okay. Mm. He was in a movie though. Like he got some big settlements though. It's just, and you know, a lot of it is not the people at the state bar that are there now, but it is an organization and an entity that was supposed to prevent this. And maybe somewhere between 1984 when this started and like, I don't know, 1990, maybe in those first five years, something could have happened because the clients now that are in this bankruptcy wouldn't have been harmed because he wouldn't have been practicing law. But no, here we are. It's, it's, it's just, it's just too much. It's unconscionable that we're here, but I'm not the only one who's feeling exacerbated. Judge Durkin out there in Illinois is feeling me, feeling it. Let's talk about this ruling from the contempt hearings. By a quick way of road so far, this contempt hearing or order to show cause started way back in 2020 when Edelson PC filed the first kind of this is a lawsuit because of the defendant's greed of it all in the Lion Air case saying that, hey, we found out that our clients haven't been paid and we're bringing it to the court's attention. Edelson PC was co-counsel with Girardi Keys with regard to the Lion Air survivors. And so they're the Illinois firm. They're working with Girardi Keys on this massive case. They don't get paid. Their clients don't get paid. And it looks like the money is gone. And they filed the lawsuit talking about the divorce being a sham and the lavish lifestyle and all the rest of it right at the beginning of December, if memory serves, of 2020. And from there, this moves forward into 2021 where the court finds, well, the court finds Girardi and Girardi Keys in contempt um, freezes assets, asks for the two, two million ish to be paid, and then gets into what all the other lawyers know and starts holding contempt hearings in 2021. Um, I watched a number of days of those contempt hearings on Zoom. You know, they had testimony from Jay Edelson, they had testimony from Griffin, from Lyra, and from others with regard to who knew what and when and why no one brought this to the attention of the court sooner. The judge was pissed the entire time. Respectful, but you could tell. Why didn't I know this? Why are these clients not paid? After the testimony, the judge asked for charts, graphs, where money was going, additional briefing, briefing about all of it. And the judge wanted to know, what can I do? Like, how can I make you all pay to make sure these clients get paid back? 
in this scathing order, we learn not only what has happened to make sure that the Lion Air clients were made whole, they were, we learned about how, but we also hear the judge's thoughts after this contempt hearing, even though the judge ultimately denies the motion. The denying the motion isn't the point here. The spilling the tea in an official court document is the point here. And the judge makes that very clear at the beginning. Like, you fucked around, you found out, and let me tell you. And let me tell you what. And let me tell you what. This is coming from Judge Durkin from November 2nd, 2022. It was, it's been busy. When I say the Girardi stuff has been busy, you're like, Emily. I'm like, I know. At the beginning of November, I was just like, there's a few sentencings in November. It's going to be quiet. And then the state bar is like, bitch, no, it's not. Judge Durkin's like, bitch, no, it's not. And then the feds are like, ha, we're arresting people. November is never going to be quiet. Happy Thanksgiving. Get some pie. It's going to be fine. Memorandum opinion and order. Tragically, on October 29th, 2018, Lion Air Flight 610 crashed shortly after takeoff, killing all aboard. That tragedy was compounded when attorney Thomas Girardi stole some of the money five of his clients were owed from settlements with defendant Boeing of claims arising out of the crash. The law firm Edelson PC served as Girardi's local counsel here in Chicago. On December 2nd, 2020, the Edelson firm filed a motion for rule to show cause, alerting the court to the fact that the clients had not been fully paid and arguing that Girardi and his firm should be held in contempt. In his response, Girardi admitted he had not paid the clients in, uh, not paid the clients the full settlement amount, and that he did not have the money to pay them the balance. On December 14th, 2020, the court found Girardi and his firm, Girardi Keys, in civil contempt and entered a judgment against them in the amount of the outstanding payments. The Edelson firm's motion also implicated Girardi Associates, David Lira, and Keith Griffin. The Edelson firm, Griffin and Lira, filed briefs and participated in a three day hearing in December 2021 at which Griffin Lira and attorneys from the Edelson firm testified. Subsequently, the Edelson firm brokered a settlement with its insurance carrier, resulting in the clients being paid in full. Again, there's the good news in this motion is that the judge is putting all this shit on the record for, well, for investigators, and that the Edelson firm went to its insurance carrier because they had one, unlike Girardi Keese, and said, our clients were stolen from. Can you cover it? And then Edelson is suing to try to get those funds back. I doubt they ever will, but the court commends Jay Edelson and his firm for being the first to pursue these issues and for doing what was necessary to see that the clients were made whole. So there's the pat on the back from the federal judge. The settlements with the Edelson firm's insurer satisfy the court's primary concern in addressing this motion. To the extent the court was considering sanctioning Griffin, Lira, and or Edelson firm attorneys for their role in misappropriation of client funds or their failure to protect the clients from Girardi, that concern is now moot because the clients have received the money to which they are entitled. So there is no longer a remedy because the remedy was the money and the money has been paid by the Edelson PC insurance carrier. To the extent any of the conduct at issue here was contemptuous, or sanctionable, and at least some of it certainly was, the court notes, there is no longer any party to be made whole and no action that needs to be compelled, which removes these issues from the realm of civil contempt and the court's power to sanction in this case. So the court's like, look, y'all pissed me off. Some of this behavior was both contemptuous and sanctionable, but there's nothing I can do because the clients have been made whole. So there's no point, it's moot. For these reasons, the motion for rule to show cause is denied. Evaluation of counsel's conduct is now left to more proper authorities, whether they be a state bar, criminal prosecutors, or one of the several ongoing civil proceedings addressing the relationship between these parties specifically or Girardi's actions more generally. The court alerted the U.S. attorney for this district to the facts of this case when this motion was first filed because Girardi's conduct is unquestionably criminal. Whoop, there it is. There is the federal judge going on the record saying, I told the prosecutors immediately because this shit's a crime. 
The court is aware that the State Bar of California, the state in which Griffin and Lira are admitted, is monitoring these proceedings. Where are the actions against them are my questions. And what are you going to do? And what did they know? I'd like to know. Girardi and his firm are in bankruptcy proceedings. And the Edelson firm has sued Girardi, Griffin, and Lira. Additionally, Girardi's theft in this case, and apparently many others, has been well publicized nationally. In light of this court's limited jurisdiction in this matter and the ongoing investigation and proceedings in other venues, the court finds that it need not take any further action with respect to Griffin, Lyra, and or the Edelson firm or any of its attorneys. Nevertheless, in the interest of the larger goal of unwinding Girardi's fraud and identifying those responsible, the court will review the salient facts that emerge from the three-day hearing. This, the court did not have to do and is doing because of how massive this scandal is. By March 30, 2020, all the clients' settlement funds were funded by transfers from Boeing to the Girardi Keys account. So March 30, 2020, the money is at Girardi Keys. According to the settlement agreements, the clients should have received their payments from Girardi within 30 days of funding. So by the end of April, 2020. But it wasn't until May 11th, 2020, after the clients complained about not having yet been paid, that partial payments were made. Installment payments were, of course, not part of any agreement with the clients. When Girardi and Keyes received the money, it should have been sent to the clients promptly. Upon receipt of partial payments, the clients immediately and understandably inquired about the balance in an email to Girardi, Griffin, and Lyra. In response, Girardi drafted a letter to one of the clients stating the following, quote, I got enough of the problem taken care of so we're able to release 50% of the settlement. I feel pretty good about the next payment. There are tax issues, etc. I'm working very hard. A similar letter to another client stated, quote, We made an agreement with Boeing that all of the cases would be resolved. They gave us special authorization to distribute 50%. I feel fairly confident the balance will become will be done within 30 days. There was also a tax issue that came up that I am trying to resolve. The court then says in Pren, similar letter claiming that Girardi was, quote, dealing with the head of the IRS regarding the supposed tax issues, which is noted. These letters contained outrageous lies, the court writes. Before sending the letters, Girardi's secretary shared them with Griffin and Lyra. In response, Lyra stated, there are no tax issues. Lyra also shared the letters with co-counsel at another firm, noting that he had intercepted this letter from going out. It goes on to say, co-counsel responded that if the client read the letter, quote, Tom won't know how to put the fire out. So they're enabling? Covering for? Trying to smooth over? What? What are they doing? What they're not doing is telling the court. That attorney also cryptically noted that the letter, quote, reminds me of the letter in the Blythe case. To which Lyra responded, quote, indeed. Lyra told Girardi's secretary, I wouldn't send any of these letter, any of these letters. There are lies and can come back to haunt Tom. All of you. They can come back to haunt all of you and have. Griffin and Lyra both testified at the hearing on this motion that the statements in those letters were false. The series of email communications proves that Griffin and Lyra knew that the clients should have been paid the full settlement amounts by April 30, 2020, at the latest, and that Girardi was planning to, and in at least two cases where the letters were sent to clients, actually did lie to the clients about the reason for his failure to do so. Even after Griffin and Lyra intercepted Girardi's letters to the clients lying to them about the status of the funds, the Edelson firm remained unaware that the settlements had been funded by Boeing more than a month earlier. At this point, the Edelson firm also did not know that Girardi was withholding settlement funds from the clients because they were under the impression that the settlements had not funded. Getting the settlements funded was their primary concern. They considered independently contacting Boeing to investigate why the settlements had not been funded, but decided against it in ultimately ill-advised deference to Girardi Case, who were the primary attorneys on the case. 
Apparently, neither Griffin nor Lyra ever informed anyone at Edelson that Girardi had lied to the clients about the reason for the delay in payment. According to Balbanian, it wasn't until the middle of June 2020 that the Edelson firm learned that Boeing had funded the settlements previously in March. They funded in March. They should have been paid in April. And co-counsel doesn't learn till June that they had been funded. Later in June, in a conversation with Griffin, Balbanian learned that Girardi had paid only part of the settlement money to the clients. Balbanian, by the way, being an attorney at Edelson PC. On July 6, 2020, Lira sent the Edelson firm a check for $77,500 as partial payment for the Edelson firm's attorney's fees. Balbanian testified that the Edelson firm never cashed this check due to their concerns about the clients not being fully paid. Balbanian told Lira and Girardi as much in a letter dated July 10th, 2020. The primary purpose of that letter, however, was to express the Edelson firm's concern and displeasures with the fact that they had not been told the settlements had been funded and that the clients had not been fully paid. Lira responded with a letter focused on responsibility for paying the Edelson firm's fees and largely ignoring the more important concern of the client's money. Lira devoted only two sentences to that issue, stating, quote, lastly, as to the current status of the payment to the clients, referred to Keith and Tom, I do not know the current status. I resigned from Girardi Keys effective June 13th, 2020, and I do not have access to such information. Balbanian eventually had a phone conversation with Girardi himself later in July. Girardi told him that the delayed payments were due to the length of time it took to get the releases of the client's claims, tax issues with the IRS, and Girardi's health issues. Remember, this is July 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. So can I understand why when you have an 80-some-old-year-old individual saying that they have health concerns and that there's delays getting paperwork back and forth at a law firm that didn't seem to be very technologically savvy, that Edelson PC might, might be a little bit forgiving given the world circumstances? I can understand that. I also don't know why the IRS is involved at all. These are settlement funds going out of the country, but that's a separate issue that maybe the court will address. Balbanian testified that to the extent he had the Edels he and the Edelson firm did not believe Girardi's explanations, they thought Girardi was simply motivated to delay in paying the Edelson firm its share of attorney's fees. So they thought Girardi was holding their money. They did not believe that Girardi was attempting to avoid paying the clients the settlement money. Yet, in text messages with Griffin in August 2020, Balbanian twice threatened that the Edelson form, uh, firm would be forced to alert the court if the clients were not paid. Yeah, you should have done it in May, but you didn't know till June, and then in August, you're still fighting with them. According to Balbanian, however, the Edelson firm, quote, ultimately felt as though the explanations were reasonable in terms of Mr. Girardi's ailments and in terms of it being the result of a mistake. They gave him the benefit of the doubt. It seems like Girardi has gotten the benefit of a doubt from quite a lot of people. And maybe that's why we're here. It goes on to say Girardi made additional partial payments to the clients in September. After further communications with Griffin about these payments, Balbanian spoke with Girardi again on September 30th. We're now at the end of September. According to Balbanian, Girardi falsely assured him that he had finally paid the clients in full. Balbanian and Edelson took Girardi at his word. But why though? Then on November 7th, 2020, Griffin texted Balbanian that Girardi still had not fully paid the clients. The Edelson firm attorneys had a phone call with Griffin thereafter, and Griffin told them he did not believe Girardi or the Girardi Keys firm had the money to pay the clients and that he had contacted a malpractice attorney on behalf of the clients. November 17th, 2020, what do we know now? This is a month after the CFO is alleged to have taken $10 million out of the firm. A month later. Here's my question. If there was $10 million to be taken in September 2020, why the fuck couldn't the $2 million go to these clients? Why are we now in November with these clients not getting paid? There must have been $10 million there if the feds are alleging that the CFO took it. The Edelson firm attorneys had a phone call with Girardi thereafter, 
and Griffin told them he did not believe Girardi or the Girardi Keys firm had the money to pay the clients and that he had contacted the malpractice attorney. It goes on to say it turns out, however, that the attorney Griffin recommended was formerly associated with Girardi Keys. The fuckery knows no bounds. And he suspiciously urged the Edelson firm attorneys not to seek court intervention. The Edelson firm wisely disregarded this suggestion, <laughs> little judge shade, and finally alerted, alerted the court regarding these circumstances by filing this motion two weeks later on December 2nd, 2020. The Edelson firm was uh, disinclined to acquiesce to that request, Girardi Keys. It goes on to say there was also evidence presented at the hearing regarding checks written to and from the Girardi Keys accounts and how much money may have been in the accounts at various points in time. I wonder if those accountings show a suspicious move of 10 mil. I have questions. There was evidence presented at Le about Lira's authority as a signatory on those accounts and irregularities in the Girardi Keys' firm's compliance with bank signature requirements. The court was interested in this evidence as it's relevant to whether the delays in alerting the court to Girardi's failure to pay clients caused losses to the clients that could have been avoided if the court had been informed earlier. And now we know that the feds are alleging that as of September, 10 million was taken. So if the court had been alerted, they could have frozen assets and gotten these clients paid sooner. This analysis is complicated by the large number of clients Girardi Keys had and the large sums of money coming into and out of the firm's accounts almost daily. The money's moving so fast, they don't even know where it's going. Hmm. Ultimately, the fact that the clients have been made whole by the settlements with Edelson's firm's insurers means that it's unnecessary for the court to pursue these questions further. Your Honor, we're curious. We would just like to, Your Honor, us and the feds and the IRS, us mostly though, we would like to know, we're so curious. We're just nosy. We just want to be told things. Tell us what was going on with the money. Where is the money? We would like to follow the money. Where is it? While the money trail is complex and unclear, the knowledge of Griffin, Lyra, and the Edelson firm is relatively uncontested and straightforward. Griffin and Lyra knew from the start that Girardi did not pay the clients when he was supposed to, and they knew at least as early as May 12th, 2020, that Girardi was lying to clients about the reasons for the failure to pay the full amounts. Griffin and Lyra both testified that they never believed that Girardi intended to steal the money and that they always assumed he would eventually pay the clients. Insert, like he'd always done before, but not because now we know the state bar has had over 200 complaints about him, over 100 relating to fuckery with trust funds, client trust accounts. This court is skeptical of these assertions, however. Mm hmm. The court has questions. Evidence of Girardi's repeated malfeasance with clients has been well documented in the press since these allegations surfaced. Griffin and Lyra worked for Girardi for many years. Indeed, Griffin is his son-in-law. It is not credible that Griffin and Lyra were so completely unaware of the prior disputes over client payments that they had no suspicions of Girardi's conduct and motives. Moreover, the email communications regarding this specific incident indicate that Griffin and Lyra were not surprised that Girardi was lying to the clients. First of all, Girardi's secretary apparently found it appropriate and necessary to check with Griffin and Lyra before sending the letters. I hope that secretary's had a long chitty chitty chat chat with the FBI. Because you're not the lawyer there, but I bet they'd love to have a conversation with you. This is a curious process unless the staff had some sense that Girardi was not to be entirely trusted. Furthermore, Griffin stated that he had intercepted the letters, implying that he was regularly playing defense with respect to Girardi's conduct. And Lyra's communications referenced another previous incidence of similar conduct. In short, it is difficult to believe Griffin and Lyra were unaware that Girardi was running a Ponzi scheme with client money, which, in fact, he was. 
That's what I said. That's what I said. That's what I said in 2020. I agree with you, Your Honor. Girardi was running his law firm like a Ponzi scheme. And the other lawyers were covering for it. It's shocking. Two years in, I should be less shocked. I'm not less shocked. I'm just more mad. In any event, even if Griffin and Lira were so naive as to be unaware that Girardi was willfully misappropriating client money, once they witnessed him lie to clients about the status of settlement money, they should have informed this court. Griffin and Lira argue that they were under no obligation to make such a report. No, Your Honor, we don't have to tell you, is what they said. In making this argument, they rely on California rules of professional conduct, which require only, quote, reasonable remedial measures and do not specifically require, quote, disclosure to the tribunal as the ABA model rules do. Here's what that means. California is one of very few jurisdictions that has a no snitch rule. Yes, that's what it's colloquially referred as, the no snitch rule. You don't have to tell. Other jurisdictions and the model rules of professional conduct, the ABA rules, state that you have to tell the court. The California rules do not. California, I imagine we're going to be changing the rules, right? That's We're going to do that, right? The rules are going to change and conform with most of the rest of the country, right? Right? That's going to that's gonna happen? I'll happily do CLE on it. Happy to. California is like, nah. It might benefit your client if the lawyers are fucking up. You don't have to tell anybody. You have to take reasonable remedial measures. Guess what intercepting the emails can be viewed as? That's right. Remedial measures. And I bet that's what they argued. Look, we took the measures. We don't need to tell the court. The California Rules of Professional Conduct do not require disclosure to the court, which is different than most other jurisdictions. The court goes on to say, but when, as was the case here, the attorney who controls the client's money has already delayed more than a month in making payments and then actively lies to the clients about the reasons for the failure to pay, quote, reasonable remedial measures must include alerting the court. The court disagrees with you, attorneys. That is especially true where the settlements in question require a court order because they involve minors. Minors, the literal widows and orphans. Whether Griffin and Lyra were directly beholden to the court orders is irrelevant. They have an obligation as officers of the court to alert the court to what amounts to using legal proceedings to cover for criminal activity. Mm. Griffin and Lyra's failure to do so here were entirely unreasonable and improper. The court has nothing but smoke for Griffin and Lyra today. No patience, just smoke. These failures were compounded by Griffin and Lyra's lack of candor to the Edelson firm. Once they learned that the settlements had been funded but the clients had not been fully paid, the Edelson firm inquired with Lyra and Girardi about the reasons. Unsurprisingly, Girardi reiterated the lies he told the clients. Lyra did not repeat Girardi's lies, but he already knew that Girardi's excuses were false and kept that information hidden from the Edelson firm. His failure to inform Edelson that Girardi was lying is a lie by omission. This kept the Edelson firm in the dark. So when Balbanian finally had a conversation directly with Girardi, he had no solid basis to immediately question Girardi's excuses. Lyra's decision to leave Girardi Keys and in his letter to Edelson rely on that departure as an implicit excuse to not reveal Girardi's lies and seemingly absolve himself of any additional responsibility for the client's money was at best disingenuous and at worst improper. Footnote one. <clears throat> Footnote one. Lyra was a signatory on the account that would have received the client's settlement money. Lyra testified that his signature was forged on some checks written from the account. 
It is not clear whether Lira signed checks drawing on this account when he should not have, considering his knowledge that the clients had not been paid. Obviously, if Lira signed checks from the account, thereby reducing its balance while knowing that the money was owed to the clients from that account, then his culpability here is much greater. Regardless, it is undisputed that both Lira and Griffin accepted salaries from Girardi Keys, knowing that the firm had not met its obligations to the clients. You know what this footnote is? This footnote is an I have questions to other investigators. Hey, other investigators, wouldn't it be interesting to know if he was signing checks on this account while knowing they weren't paid? Shouldn't we figure that out? This court's not in a position to do it, but you are. Maybe have a look-see. AUSAs, California State Bar. Let's just, we're going to direct it in a footnote. Lawyers always read a footnote. Your professors always get the exam questions from the footnote. So you're trained to read the footnote. Sometimes they're real sassy. This one's very much a, ask this question. See what, see what you find under that rock. The court goes on. They've moved on from the son-in-law and go on. Griffin's conduct was just as bad, if not worse. Here's your smoke, Griffin. Like Lyra, Griffin knew that Girardi's excuses were lies. And like Lyra, Griffin abated the lies, abetted the lies, not abated the lies, abetted the lies, aided and abetted the lies by hiding them from the Edelson firm. Griffin was in regular communication with Balbanian through the summer and fall of 2020. Not only did Griffin not reveal Girardi's lies, he came perilously close to repeating them when he told Balbanian in a text message, I know Girardi is working on this. Girardi was working on nothing but trying to hide the theft. Smoke. Girardi was working on nothing but trying to hide the theft is what the court says. Even when he finally informed the Edelson firm in November 2020 that the clients had not been fully paid and that Girardi didn't have the money to pay them, Griffin did not reveal that he had known since May that Girardi was lying to clients. Further, he continued to attempt to dissuade the Edelson attorneys from involving the court by recommending they consult a conflicted former Girardi case attorney who he claimed he could arrange to pursue malpractice claims. Conflict of interest. This conduct is at best an effort to pass the buck and at worst, a knowing cover-up, which is very close to what Jay Edelson and the Edelson PC law firm alleged in the case that alleges civil RICO. The court goes on to say, none of it demonstrates concern with the money owed to clients whose family members were victims of a tragic accident. All of it is simply inexcusable. By contrast, there is no evidence that the Edelson firm ever had knowledge that Girardi was lying to clients. Balbanian's and Jay Edelson's testimony regarding their communications with Griffin, Lira, and Girardi shows that they regularly inquired to confirm that the clients would be paid. Their inquiries were constantly met with excuses begging forgiveness and more time. The court understands the desire to extend professional courtesy, but the Edelson firm should have acted sooner than they did. They admitted as much in their testimony. That being said, the evidence in the record indicates that unlike Griffin and Lyra, the Edelson firm never had any reason to believe Girardi was perpetuating a massive fraud. In effect, they deferred to Girardi, who had a reputation as a titan of the plaintiff's bar in California and throughout the country. Indeed, Girardi's gaudy displays of wealth and extravagant lifestyle furthered the fiction that he and his firm were successful and solvent. Well, that's a, that's a sentence, Your Honor. I appreciate the use of the word gaudy, and I'm going to read it again for effect. Indeed, Girardi's gaudy displays of wealth and extravagant lifestyle furthered the fiction that he and his firm were successful and solvent, also alleged in the RICO lawsuit that the lifestyle was a cover-up from the firm falling apart. From the Edelson firm's perspective, based on the information available to them, the risk they were running was simply a betting delayed payment, not a risk of non-payment. The delay was contrary to the settlement agreements and to the court's orders approving the settlements, 
but delays are often a fact of life for one reason or another. Illnesses like Girardi's being one. Delays are not inherently criminal or unethical. And delayed monetary payments can be easily remedied if necessary with interest payments. This realm of potential risk the Edison firm reasonably perceived is not so great that the court could find that the Edelson firm or any of its attorneys bears any responsibility for the client's potential losses. To the extent the Edelson firm or any of its attorneys did bear any such responsibility, they more than made up for it by arranging for its insurer to pay the clients, which was the only somewhat positive development from this debacle. And then the court goes in. Thomas Girardi's actions are a stain on the legal profession and, due to the international nature of this case, have damaged the reputation of the American legal system. All of the plaintiffs in this case were citizens and residents of another country, many of whom do not speak English and have little to no experience with American society and certainly not its court system. Most are not very well off. They all suffered the tragic loss of family members. In need of help, they trusted American attorneys to shepherd them through the legal process and achieve at least some relief for their losses with amounts of money that are likely life-changing in their country. Girardi took advantage of vulnerable people at their most vulnerable moments, and he used the prestige of his profession, the reputation of American courts, and the imprintator of this court to do it. It is nearly impossible to mend such a breach of trust. The best we can do is demonstrate that the legal system Girardi besmirched has the ability to rectify its errors and bring bad actors to account. With the hearings and settlements initiated by the Edelson firm, a step has been taken in that direction. For these reasons, the motion for rule to show cause is denied and then signed by the judge. It is 14 pages of smoke, the likes of which I have never seen and will probably end up in legal textbooks because Judge Durkin did an excellent job of not just breaking down what prosecutors need to be looking at, what the feds need to be looking at, but also what other legal regulators should be looking at. The judge pointed out the rules of professional conduct, the emails, what we know about Girardi lying, what the other attorneys knew about Girardi lying, and laid it out. Who knew what and when? It bolsters a lot of what's already in Jay Edelson's lawsuit that I've covered on this channel and on the podcast alleging civil RICO that includes not just these attorneys, but Erica Girardi, the legal lender, the CFO, and others. But I agree with the judge that Tom Girardi's actions are a stain on the legal profession. And the words here are much stronger than the words of the State Bar of California. But you know what the State Bar of California didn't say yet? Is that they're going to be looking at the ABA model rules of professional conduct so that when this comes up, attorneys must tell the court. Because had this court been involved in August, would there have still been money there? August is months after this should have been paid. And at least those clients could have been made whole. At least now they have been. At the detriment, really, to the Edelson firm. It's absolutely staggering. This case is staggering. We have a part two to this to talk more about everything that has happened in this case next week. I, I cannot wait to hear your thoughts on this from the arrest to the state bar to this scathing indictment of Girardi Keese, his son-in-law, and Keith Griffin. Son-in-law being married to his daughter. But this lays out what this judge thinks should be done. And I want to hear your thoughts about it. So with that, it is definitely time to go. It is time to go. This is a long episode. We had a lot to cover. It's been busy this November. And with that, it's time to say goodbye. Thank you for being here and thank you for being a law nerd. If you want to hang out in the back chat and the after party when I record these episodes, we're at lawnerdsunite.com. And uh, raise a glass. Raise a glass. I'm raising 40 ounces of water because it's all we can do is stay hydrated this winter. And with that, may your families be well. May your Wi-Fi be plentiful. No, that's not right at all. We're just, oh, we're just doing it wrong. Just keep going, Emily. 
<laughs> may your toilet paper be plentiful. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your families be well. May the odds be ever in your favor. May you have a wonderful week leading up into the holidays and hopefully a little time off to spend with those that matter most, hopefully in person. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. I'm now repeating myself six times. Okay, let's go. Bye. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.